Folks, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Tim Mascon, Dean of the Cole College Business, and we appreciate very much all of you being here. And sorry about the uh, the accommodations, but it's a it's a great problem to have. There are a few empty seats. If, if you have a seat next to you that's empty, would you raise your hand? And if anyone wants to wants to come in and sit down, there's a couple on this row in here. Come on in, and, and, and we've got a little bit of room down front if you can. Beginning with this lecture this year, and this is our 17th year for this series, all of these will be captured now digitally. We're going to upload this within the next couple of days or so, and this will be available uh, on, on the Colt website as well. And so it becomes another another business like that, another medium uh, that you can use if you want to if you want to catch part of this. Also, each of these, those of you who haven't been in the past, we got a program, and these programs will distribute outside after the lecture is over. So they'll be out in the uh, just outside these doors immediately when when Mr. Coonan is uh, is done. Uh, if you get a chance. We hope you take a look at who is participating in this lecture series and it's inside your program since 1990. It's been an exceptional opportunity for the Coles College to invite real thought leaders, local, national, and like today's uh, special guest, international, to talk about their business and to share their insights with you. And so in that regard, we think this is an exceptional uh, opportunity for you and, and know that, that you'll, you're really going to, uh, to enjoy today's, uh, today's lecture. Today's special guest, kicking off our 17th year, as I mentioned, is Steve Coonan. Mr. Coonan is Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President of TBS and Turner Network Television, TNT. Mr. Coonan is recognized by his peers and within the industry, and you'll see just momentarily, as a creative leader, a marketing innovator, who leads one of the planet's two pioneering television brands. Five years ago, Coonan implemented TNT's first strategic brand positioning, TNT We Know Drama. Despite initial doubts from industry experts, the positioning has been a resounding success. With TNT now holding position as television's destination for drama and ad-supported cable's number one network in delivery of key adult demographics, for four straight years. In June of 2004, Mr. Coonan oversaw the rebranding of TBS, now television's very funny network. The positioning has proven successful with the network ranking as ad-supported cable, number one network last year in total day delivery of adults 18 to 34. In addition, TBA, TBS claimed that supported cable top four sitcoms among adults 18 to 49. Sex in the City, Everybody Loves Raymond, Seinfeld, and Friends. TBS is right now gearing up production on two new scripted comedies for the network, My Boys, and Ten Items or Less. Both are slated for premiere just two months from now in November of this year. And in addition, the network is putting together a late night block of original programming with several pilots in the works. Now prior to coming to TBS in February of 2000, just six years ago, Mr. Coonan spent 14 years at the Coca-Cola Company, serving most recently as Vice President of Consumer Marketing where he was responsible for the positioning and development of brand and volume building strategies for bottle cans, carbonated and non-carbonated products marketed in the U.S. 
Kunin began his career 20 years ago with Coca-Cola after graduating from the University of Georgia, Terry College of Business, holding various positions, including promotions manager of the theft and sales division, manager of national promotions, and director of entertainment marketing and national promotions. In 92, he served as head of worldwide advertising on the widely acclaimed Always Coca-Cola campaign. In 94, he was promoted to Vice President of Sports and Entertainment Marketing for Coca-Cola, and in 97, added responsibility for consumer marketing as well. In 98, he was named Sports Executive of the Year by Sports Business Journal. It's an honor and privilege, privilege for me to introduce a native of land, TBS and Turner Chief Operating Officer, Steve Cooper. I was in college, I would have been sleeping right now. So I, I hope that I don't disappoint you. Um, I'm going to talk today about two things that are important to me television and creativity. And they go hand in hand. Our lives are crazy, they're getting crazy. When I was a kid, ADD was an illness. Today it's a life skill. You have to be able to manage it multiple things at multiple times and pay attention in so many different ways to so many different things. But when people come home, they're tense, they're tired, they need a release. And television has become literally the mood elevator of our time. Looking at this chart very quickly, 51% of our leisure time activity is watching television. 51%, which translates into four hours a day the average American, I'm going to show you a lot of research today, the average American watches television. And that's good for my business. And I want to thank everyone who encouraged you to watch it. When you look at and hear the demise of TV, oh, the iPod, the this, the that, those things are great, but they're the satellite surrounding television. Couple of consumer trends. People are buying bigger and more expensive TVs to watch more programs. The iPod, the mobile cell phone, all of these programming sources are additive to the television watching experience, not substitutes for the television watching experience. And you see as you look on your broadband and even this presentation is going digital, you'll be able to see, hopefully I'll be advertised one day, I mean, spot, I'm, I'm part of the sponsored series, and advertisers are looking for messages to supplement their TV uh, program. So when we talk about television and talk about all these different devices, one thing stands clear. The only way people are going to use them is if they're creatively satisfied by them. So that's kind of my break into creativity. And I brought some experts to talk about creativity. How so many of the struggles as far as start to fly? It's not a script seeing the world through a different pair of eyes. It depends on where you live. Collision of cultures. It's thought production. Everybody sees it differently. It's the pressure that's created when even the smallest things are opposed to one another. It's complex. It's complex. People say no, no, no. I don't want that. I will never want that. And sooner or later, a good salesman will see the opening. And make the same possibility. Obstacle. Something has to be what you want and what's in your way. There are no maps. There are no rules. You start in the detail. And then you pull out from it. You set the parameters, and then where you go within that is, is essentially what determines what you're going to communicate. Trust. You start to think in our mind. Also, you all going to live and work together. And so if you can keep loose and keep things. Uh, uh, moment to moment, and a moment to moment reality, it's uh, usually pretty juicy. What makes a great artist or a great businessman is the people who are visionary who took a risk. What would you do if you were in that situation? You don't know what the outcome is. The key to surprise is contrast. As simple as that. And that's, that's everything. talk to each one of these artists about what is creativity to them, what does it mean? Because creativity to me is everything. It's my personal currency. The amount of creativity I had coursing through me as I stood up here, but edited because this is being taped. Um, 
It will make me smile through the day. But what I brought today to stay focused is my seven creative catalysts for creativity. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> Did have the time to speak, to come up with something that has a lot of rhyme to it. So in 2000, when we, when we took over um, TNT, the brand didn't exist. Turner Network Television, Major Ted Turner, a business genius, a maverick, who programmed his networks to what he liked. National Geographic, submarine movies, professional sports. And while those things worked for a while when they're up in a world of choice, in a world of choice, one thing matters, and that's brands. Brands are that linkage to your brain that help you navigate. There are 500 television channels available today. You only have 11.4 favorites at most because your brain can't process. Think about categories of soft drink, toothpaste. You don't go 11.4 deep into there. You might go too deep into there. So television is about building conscious consideration. It's about your brand. It's about your favorite channel. Some of you love Adult Swim, which is our cousin. Some of you love um, ESPN. Some of you love, hopefully, TBS. But those conscious considerations make you stop there on the dial. And by building a brand, you're able to make that interruption in the consumer's mind. So my first catalyst, my first rule, Daniel Day-Lewis said it in the presentation, see the world through a different pair of eyes, which is code for research. Research is key. Understanding people's thoughts, understanding people's ideas, asking questions in a different way to get the answers that you seek is so, so important. So I'm a big believer in research. And I also think that you have to manage research so you get the, not the results you want, but the results you need. So we ask people not what they thought of our networks, because they're not going to say. They're not going to be able to articulate much. We ask them to draw them. And so we ask them to draw a TV. And what you saw was wrestling and cowboys and Indians and movies. But what you really saw were part of itself with question marks. I don't know. If I asked you to draw a TV, I guarantee you could. If I asked you to draw ESPN, it would probably be an athlete. They could not articulate what TNT stands for. In essence, we weren't known for the sum of our parts. We were known on occasion for some of our programming that might have a particular interest. But in a world of 500 channels, that's not conscious consideration. That's nothing. So what we did was we didn't play in the demographics which make up TV. As Dean Muscon was reading all these demographics to you in leadership in 18 to 49 and 18 to 34, it probably didn't mean a whole lot. Well, there's a sales currency of television that you can't market to sales currency. So we did psychographics. Psychographics break into five distinct groups of television viewers, and I want to discuss those with you. The first is cultural highbrows. These people's attitude was, I didn't do something much on TV that interests me, or I live in how much our children watch today. We don't like these people. <laughs> can't stand them. But demographically, they look it's like one of the highest appeal groups because they have high income, and on paper, they look like a great opportunity, but their attitudes of television are negative, and when they do watch television, it's for information or news. Again, people we don't like. <laughs> the opposite of them is TV worshippers, which is French for potatoes. So any of you think in French, but worshippers equal potato, but it's unseemly to have potato in a presentation. So, TV worshippers are people who watch, fact, on average, 41 hours of television a week. That is a full-time job. <laughs> 41 hours of television. Did any of you know people like that? Any of you like that? I was going to give you cash. Any of you like that? Yeah. Nice job. Um, I brought gift certificates. Look. These are people, when asked if you had 10 more hours of leisure time a week, what would you do? Answer, watch more television. I love these people. <laughs> Next to them is competition lovers or sports chunkies. They're male and species. They're like a group of fish. They swim from sporting event to sporting event. And when the sporting events are over, they watch highlights of the sporting event. <laughs> Sound familiar? 
Then there's comedy lovers, young women usually, who want mood elevation. They want to feel good. They want to see something that makes them feel better. It is literally almost a drug for them to come home and laugh. And Sex in the City and Will and Grace and a lot of their shows gave that um, euphoric feeling, that mood elevation. And that was the reason they watched and loved those shows. And then there's drama lovers. Those are people who want television that makes them think and feel. They want both their heart and their minds tied. Not melodrama, not soap opera for their heart, but a balance of heart and mind. And drama lovers are who we at TNT went after. We threw away, we focused the very demographically desirable highbrow because we couldn't get them. We threw away comedy lovers because we weren't going to program to them. And we kept the people who watch everything, the drama lovers, and when we're in sports, the competition lovers, because sports are live male drama. Number two rule is fearlessness. You have no idea how much I am editing myself up here. <laughs> I'm not scared to say anything. My filter broke in the factory. My mom must have broken it or something. I say stuff, I get in trouble. A lot. So today I will behave. But I have learned, and I will tell you a quick story. I was doing a press conference about eight years ago. No, about five years ago. On, and I had a reporter ask me in a press conference with about 100 reporters, what's dramatic about NASCAR? And I talked about the competition ending within a hundredth of a second, and that you risk life and death. And he said, so how are you going to show that drama in your presentation? I said, I have this idea about putting heart monitors on the wives of NASCAR. <laughs> Rule number one, don't brainstorm during the presentation. Just like I probably shouldn't be freelancing right now. <laughs> Rule number two, don't do it two weeks after the most loved guy in NASCAR hits the wall and dies. You know? <laughs> I was attacked by a hundred reporters. And being my natural reaction, I fought back how good an idea this really was. <laughs> so at 1 o'clock that day when Turner sent out attractions, Mr. Koenig was not speaking on behalf of the company. <laughs> you, know, so you quickly learned that sometimes fearlessness and foolishness are just changing a few letters around. <laughs> today I want to talk about fearlessness. People are scared to look silly. Why do kids pick their nose in public? Because they don't know better. Why don't you? Well, some of you probably don't know <laughs> But the truth is, we are based in fear, and fear inhibits creativity. You're scared to say an idea in a class because you want to look silly. Well, you know what? Failure to say that idea in a class, or failure to say that idea in a brainstorming at work, or failure to say that idea to your boss is going to make you look silly because it's going to hold you behind. Being able to say to people, this is what I think, and this is what I think is a good idea, or what do you think of this idea, or a boss, when you're managing people, building a safe environment to share ideas is the only way as an organization you're going to grow. But ideas not tethered to strategy are worthless. So there has to be a criteria a, for everything you do. And for us, the criteria for our brand is focused, relevant, being able to consistently deliver, and most important, being unique and fresh. And we're the first and only network dedicated to drama. Now, when you do those things, you have to decide what do you stand for. Drama is a big word. We actually put drama in, instead of thinking and feeling, because we know thinking and feeling could get you in trouble in places when it's not very pithy as an ad slogan. So, what did we mean when we said we knew drama? Was it melodrama? Was it soap opera? And we decided, and you'll see today, you saw that we'll use celebrities to be our spokesperson people and let people describe drama in their own terms. Now, when it comes to branding, those things are fairly easy. When it comes to running a business, you have to make decisions. Our number one programming at the time on TNT, at the wrestling band, was WCW Nitro, highest rated programming on the network. And we canceled it. In the history of television, no guy's either been brave enough or stupid enough to get a fine line <laughs> to cancel their top program. But how can you be a drama brand and have wrestling? You can't. And we said that part of building a brand is sacrificing. 
It's not only what you keep and what you do, it's what you don't do. And we decided that we could not be a brand if we had wrestling. So we sold this to the um, WWE and we got out of our number one rated program. Um, but what we got was probably the finest spokesperson roster this side of Nike, from Spike Lee to Ashley Judd, Denzel Washington, and on and on and on, and the page is going forever, of people talking about drama and making us the place for drama and making us the place where you can always go see a good drama. And it's worth. We're entering our fifth year as a top network on cable television. Um, conflict. Again, something you probably won't learn in school. Here's a fact. An oyster only makes a pearl when it's irritated. Does anybody know how a pearl is made? An oyster has a... Does anybody ever eat an oyster? Very soft. A piece of sand gets in. Oyster's irritated. It hurts. So he starts spinning a pearl. His body has a natural reaction to that irritation. Well, most people also have a natural reaction to irritation. They shut down. They avoid conflict. I love conflict. <laughs> With ground rules, creative conflict. Because I take your idea and your idea and bounce my idea and your idea, and hopefully, at the end of the day, you have a pearl. And it's okay to disagree. Obviously, all within the bounds of good taste. All kidding aside, within good taste. And again, as a leader, building an environment where people can string together pearls, where people can have conflict. Because that's only when you get good ideas, is when there's that natural creative tension. When you work in television, your biggest irritant is your sales group. They represent your revenue, but they want to sponsor everything. And when you look at TV networks, you can see which ones have a good balance with their sales group, which one their sales group dominate. Because when you watch some networks, you say to yourself, oh, they have this commercial. And those are networks that don't put the viewer first. And we believe that if you have a great viewer experience, you'll get great ratings, great ratings, lead to advertiser demand. And to date, it's worked. But you watch some networks, MTV has 17 minutes of advertising an hour. TNT has 12. There is a difference. And a lot of it is because of the consumer experience. You, the MTV generation, are a captive audience. So you're, and their media is very desirable, so their capacity goes up. We're talking to a more mature adult audience, not mature, older in age, older. <laughs> and their temperance for the interruptions are much less. So you have to understand your audience, and you have to understand your conflict. One of our conflicts, one of the ways to avoid conflict, is to write what is and what is not. Drama is contemporary, not melodramatic. It's adult relevant versus family fair. It's citing an action, not dull and plot, etc. When you define what you are, you also must define what you're not. Because if you don't give people the parameters, it will seep in, and you'll be deciding on the fly, and you'll see arbitrary to a staff or to an organization. And to lead an organization, they will follow if you give the proper ground rules and the motivations for those ground rules. One of the other elements that we've lived with, let's see what this is. A great story is a journey. I think a great story has to say something about the human experience. Walk out now, that was 
it probably means no never mind to you. Cable now is 60% of the viewing on television. It's only 35% of the ad dollars. And the reason is it's because older people control ad budgets and believe broadcast is better because broadcast has been around longer. And normally money flows where the people are. I can't think of another industry that that doesn't happen. So all of our attacks, everything we do, is to go level the playing field and create one television world against broadcast. So to create one television world, we needed to take Superstation, which really had no meaning, into a youth-driven substitute for advertisers. Again, back to the research. We pounded the research to that comedy lover, that young female audience, and said to her, our, our brand promise. Our brand, the TV is very funny, very contemporary. Our brand promise, is that we make you laugh out loud and feel good. That mood elevation I talked about. Feel good by connecting you to comedy with characters and stories you love. Very simple premise. If we, we do buy our movies and we do show our shows based on the storytelling of the funny. Now, we wanted to be the authority of funny. We wanted to be the epicenter of funny for consumers. So we created commercials. Have any of you driven by our downtown headquarters? Does it look anything like that headquarters? Okay, don't tell anyone who doesn't live in Atlanta. <laughs> so what we did was, by being the epicenter of funny, we have built this call center where all activity takes place. So I want to show you a commercial that um, comes from our call center, and I want you to look for all the fringe characters that are in our in our um, sitcoms in the commercial. And then we're going to show you our research department, the Department of Humor Analysis, which is next. So take a look at these two. Well done. Thank you. Nation can take on the strange one. And there's literally more than a fork in the road. 1-800-TBS-FUNNY. I just saw a guy from the Mumbo Rising Grapes, and I got a little piece of money. Plastic Grape Theater. What's your location? Well, it's been going to the Capitol. Fancy Pants or Urban Grunge? Oh, these pants are fancy already. Fancy Pants. And the man? Well, he's a uh, kind of rich pompous guy. Are you saying he's wearing loafers? Yeah, we're just loafers. Uh-huh. Is he with someone? It's his daughter. So that's not his daughter. Who is she? Arm candy. Anywhere you can spit out the gray? This one is called, it's a long trip waiting to snap. No, it's pretty low, is it? Is arm candy really working for the art piece? Oh, she is working it. Is this guy any chance of a surrealist exhibition? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm standing behind a big ear. I know. Okay, we got a safe shirt, compass shirt, arm candy. Sir, I can give you a green light on this. This is mighty funny. <laughs> Oh, no, let's not get greedy, sir. This one over here is called This Is Not a Boating Accident. And you might recognize one of the actors in this one. The TBS Department of Humor Analysis. It's the department's sole mission to study, analyze, and interpret what the average person finds funny. <laughs> in their important work by participating in this ongoing humor study. The information you share with us will be fed into the humor analysis mainframe and shred so that we don't have to share it with anyone else. Tell us what you find funny at tbshumorstudy.com. <laughs> the real department, we're taking applications. Of <laughs> Those commercials... I'm pleased to say one of the, both of them won the Gold Lion in time as the best commercial and television in the world. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, they also won the Director's Guild Award and several other nice things. But the only reason that I care about that is because they help people build their brand, not that they win awards. Awards are nice, building your brand is everything. And they've helped us become a very funny place. Now, one of the other things where I'm going to go a little bit off the script that you saw in these commercials is how hard, and we talked about this before we met, how hard, how subjective comedy is. If I put a gun to this gentleman's head, most of you won't think that's funny, that we're in a dramatic hostage situation. But if I had watched this gentleman slip walking up the aisle, we'd be laughing our ass off. <laughs> What's funny to me might be drama to you. But what's funny to me might not be funny to you. And when you're trying to produce comedy for large audiences, it's very, very, very difficult. 
and it makes you a gambler. You have to start placing your bet. This is an industry where you have nine out of ten shows fail. Few statistics. Last show, 41 new series were launched on broadcast television. Only 14 made it back this year. 63% of the last six season shows have failed to survive the second season. Nine out of ten have failed. There hasn't been an original comedy hit doing double digit ratings in, ten, in eight years since Will and Grace. And in the past 15 years, broadcast television has launched 650 comedies and eight have become a hidden syndication. So the odds of success are extraordinarily small. But if we stop taking chances, then we'll never grow our business. So original programming is where you place, place your bet, and it's high risk, and it's high reward. Okay. You have your crime scene ready for you. You'll just step right this way. Thank you so much. This is a business of not knowing. This is a business of placing bets. A bet we're getting ready to make in December is a show called Ten Items or Less. It features a very, very funny um, improv troupe led by John Lear, who you see in the, in the middle. And the entire show takes place in a live operating supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> they did not want to shut one down. We found one in the outside of LA and shot the entire show for seven weeks in the supermarket while it operated. So I want to show you a minute piece from 10 items or less from Peter Max. Mm. 
Wesley Scott always wanted to prove to his father he could make it in a big city. But when his father died, everything changed. Now, Wesley's coming back home to take over his father's grocery store. And he's about to discover when life hands you limits. Health insurance is being canceled. I repeat, health insurance is being canceled. It's time to fix the health insurance. <laughs> and through this, the health insurance was canceled prior to the injury. <laughs> Nothing to be embarrassed of. My job is to sell this just as much as my job is to sell Brussels sprouts. And believe me, people do some pretty weird things with Brussels sprouts. <laughs> TBS presents a new plan of coverage that will make you look hard before it falls to the eye. You're going to see some bright, shiny faces. Most of them look like they've been washed. Maybe a few of us didn't brush this morning, or at least one. I can tell somebody. <laughs> It's 50% alcohol, so my guess is that it's going to go on a, a, a little hard. Who <laughs> 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 knows? But at least we believe in the people. We believe that they're funny, which leads to number six. It's foster creative environment. Got a few people are writing this down who are scaring the crap out of you. You really are. It's important for creativity to be infused in everything you do. Not to run amok, but creativity tended to strategy. Um, fostering a creative environment means rewarding people for their ideas, but also infusing it in every part of life. So one of the things that we have done, let me show you a couple of examples. One is Springboard. Springboard is an employee-driven innovation advisory council. Everything you see, the logo is all designed by the employees. It started with the employees. And it really is because of the manager's dilemma. I wish that all of you run a business if that's what you want to do in your future. And if you do, you have a real dilemma. If you have people come to you with ideas, and they're interesting, but they're not quite there, and you're encouraging and enabling, chances are you're going to get misunderstood. And the next thing you know, you're going to find this project has grown in the organization to some big monster that's out of control. If you, um, if you shut down, I shouldn't do that. I didn't do one too. If you shut down the creativity, people aren't going to come back to you with another idea. So the manager's dilemma is you can't foster false hope, nor can you shut down things without giving them a chance. So we built this innovation incubator called Springboard, where employees can build their own ideas, test them with consumers for that validity, and um, bring to the senior management team after they've been tested, researched, thought through for evaluation of potential funding. And so what we're trying to do is bring risk reinvention and value to our employees and let them experience the ups and downs of creating ideas rather than us as a management team saying yes or no. Because when they come to us with a vested idea with positive consumer feedback behind it, it's very difficult to say no to a good idea. So we've just started that this year. One of the other things that we've been doing for the past six years is living the brand with a ritual called the Drammy. The Drammys are our celebration of the drama that we create every day at work. Whether it's Comcast slicing in the porn channel for TNT and run for four hours with no consumer complaints. <laughs> <laughs> or a dramatic celebrity encounter or some of the other shenanigans that get caused in our work. And the dramas have taken a life of their own as our own creative force. One night come together to see all the pure Sedgwick. <laughs> so I brought a very quick clip of last year's Grammys, the musical. Oh, it was so hard looking at all your faces. Then boom, it hit me. It's the people, stupid. It's the people that made us so great.
foster a creative environment, and understand that ideas are disposable. So, that concludes my talk today. I hope each one of you builds a personal currency. It's extraordinarily important in the business world that you are known for something. And I am happy to if it's okay. Take questions. Sure. program around ideas like DVRs and TVO? Yeah. A couple of, couple of things. Number one is more live programming. We are doing a program that we're testing now. It's called Midnight Money Madness. Um, it comes on around 12, 1230. It's on for three hours a night, four nights a week. And it's all about text messaging. And you, you play along with text messaging and you can win anywhere from 100 to 5,000 bucks a night. We're trying and testing these things that have no value if there's TiVo. To be blunt with you, we are TiVo. We buy your favorite shows and show them at better times. And so where you get hurt is on hit programming. The Closer was the number one TiVo show in the summer. And we don't get paid for that. So I, I now feel the pain. But American Idol doesn't get paid. What advertisers pay for is only live watch programs, which means if you pause your TiVo for one second to go to your roommate, what? If you're a Nielsen family, that does not get measured. That's called delayed programs. So it is a real issue, and we are creatively trying to come up with programs. Another reason why we're in live sports. Most people don't watch sports on TiVo. They watch sports live because they don't want the results later. So, we are a little bit more immune than broadcast, but it is a real issue. Yes, sir. Yeah, I noticed uh, in the past like, year and a half, there's a break aren't showing much on the TBS. Is that because you're going towards that comment film? Yes, they don't fit our brand anymore. The Braves were part of the legacy of TBS. They don't build TBS. But every time we run the Braves, we have four times less viewers than when we know. So from a business standpoint, it's not good. So starting in 2008, we've eliminated the Brave from TBS, except in Atlanta. And they'll be available through Fox Sports Net, which is a wonderful place for the Brave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, do you all kind of, kind of hire statisticians to kind of look at what kind of like what programs you all should show on certain days? We hire researchers who help us estimate as part of our process and our team that analyze how they think shows will do on us, what time periods are most favorable, and look at trends. Yes, we do. I saw a young lady in the middle here who had her hand up. Uh, I was wondering if you guys would get into um, reality TV. Will we get into reality TV? We have been in reality TV, and we are now out of reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. I wish you could go off. We had, um, we had a show that, again, Disposable diaper. This one got close to the end. It was called Loser Leaves Town. And the idea was to find rivalries have been going on between families since Romeo and Juliet in the 1400s. The Capulets and the Montagues, Hatfields and McCoys. Well, we were looking for two families who were willing to bet their house and compete. Family, dog versus dog, kids versus kids, parents versus parents. I didn't do it, don't get mad at me. <laughs> I bought it, but I let it go. I paid all the fees. And it was called Loser Leaves Town. We found two families in Ohio, neighbors, in multi-million dollar houses, who hated each other so bad that they heard about this and contacted us and agreed. And you know what they hated each other over? Their political differences. They hated each other so bad they forgot why they hated each other. And it was, they were so mean-spirited when we saw the casting tape of the family, we said, we can't do this. <laughs> we were literally going to production. These people are 
they might kill each other. We were scared, so we bailed on that idea. Um, and, and that was a good thing, because one of the things we learned again through research is people are coming to us for our sitcom, for Sex in the City, Family Guy, Everybody Loves Raymond. They want smart, relatable storytelling. And these reality shows certainly weren't smart and relatable. So we replaced it with things like Ten Items or Less, or My Boys, which is scripted that's coming up that I think better fits the network. Yes, sir. Yes, we get lots of support from time to time. <laughs> they leave us alone. <laughs> they do. We're very autonomous. Time Warner is run very autonomously. Um, they want us to be best in class. That is first or second in class. That is their business strategy. We work with Warner Brothers. We work with HBO. We work with AOL. We work with Time Magazine, but it's all arm's length. In fact, it's much easier to work with a company you're not affiliated with in you know, entertainment a lot of times than it is to work with our Because you always want to leave the impression for talent that they can get the best deal at your place. So if somebody feels that Warner Brothers is advantaging Turner, then they might not bring their best product to Warner. So through that, we have very unadvantaged deals. You have one more, one more question over there. Sure. Yes, sir. As far as being here, being the Arena Drama Network, how do you position yourself for the network with FX and the shows like The Shield and things like that? Well, the question is how do we position as a drama network compete against other networks who have top dramas? Well, yeah. FX has Nip Talk and The Shield and great dramas, but they also have King of the Hill, um, that 70s show. They also have Cops. They have, um, I'm trying to remember, they have some other crap. Um, <laughs> the point is, they don't have a brand. They have some shows, and their shows are excellent. Um, their shows remind me of mushroom. You know how a mushroom kind of grows out of crap in the field? <laughs> their shows, I love this, I'm sorry. <laughs> their shows come out of nowhere. They don't have a lead, and they don't have a schedule, they don't have a platform. They've built very strong, compelling shows. The problem is, they're at 10 o'clock at night, they can't build on top of that. Yeah. How long have you been waiting to use the mushroom? I've used it. 